Now I'm going to suggest some guidelines for you to consider before getting started on your acknowledgement of country. The reason why I've created this particular part of the module uh, is in direct response to some common fears and hesitations that I've heard from many people and the reasons why they might avoid a, an acknowledgement of country is for the fear of getting it wrong or causing offence. So we're going to have a look at some protocols, some key considerations, and this will support cultural appropriateness and cultural safety when conducting your acknowledgement of country. So an acknowledgement of country should be performed whether a First Nations individual or many individuals are present or not. So it doesn't matter who's sitting in the crowd or not, an acknowledgement of country is something that should be practiced anyway. It should not be expected that a First Nations person will do an acknowledgement of country. In my experience, there have been too many times when I see non-Indigenous people wait for a First Nations individual to step up and do an acknowledgement of country. I just want to remind you that anybody can do an acknowledgement of country, whether you're First Nations, non-Indigenous, anyone and everyone can do an acknowledgement of country. Emergency procedures such as fire evacuation information can come first because safety is important. And if a fire happened to happen while you're conducting a, an acknowledgement of country, people in the audience would know what to do. However, an acknowledgement of country should be front and center before you're about to share, deliver, um, you know, present whatever the occasion is. So an acknowledgement of country should be conducted at the beginning before general housekeeping, such as where toilets are located, where to get your drinks, etc. There are no particular protocols or rules for an acknowledgement of country. Again, these are some suggested guidelines from me to you. There is no set script or wording. So if you uh, linked into this short course, to try and get a transcript as a, you know, a quick cheat sheet, perhaps. Um, this is not the place because I'm going to take you through the process um, in a way that allows you to understand the depth um, and con context of an acknowledgement of country and so that you can deliver it in a respectful way. There is no set word limit. When you start strong with I acknowledge, it's a very bold and confident approach. I've heard on many occasions people conduct an acknowledgement of country with a wishy-washy, I'd like to begin by, I'm going to start with, before we get started on our presentation, I would like to. I find all of these sentence starters, starters there that are all crossed out quite wordy and it feels like you're taking your time to get to the point. If you start strong with, I acknowledge you come across as bold and confident. This is a personal preference and a personal suggestion for you to consider before getting started. Custodians or owners, which one to use? So the short answer is that both are used and there are many people using either or all. Um, my best advice for this is again engaging and consulting with the traditional custodians or traditional owners of the land upon which you will conduct your acknowledgement of country and ask them what they preferred to be acknowledged as and follow their direction. Now I'll provide a bit more information around each of these terminologies. So an owner is a reminder that the sovereignty of their land was never formally ceded. And custodians is a reminder of the ongoing obligation to look after country and that First Nations people don't own the land, but they care for the land. So depending on where you conduct your acknowledgement of country, these might provide you with a bit more insight uh, behind each of these terms. It is preferred to say 
and correctly pronounce the name of the traditional custodians or owners. So the nation, people and clan. So include their name or how they like to be acknowledged within your acknowledgement of country. So for example, I acknowledge the traditional custodians or owners of the lands upon which we meet, the Jolaywara people of the Gorgialanji nation. So now we're being specific because we are actually saying the name of and pronouncing correctly the name of the particular people where the land upon which we meet um, for the acknowledgement of country. Rather than keeping a very basic, I acknowledge the traditional custodians or owners of the lands upon which we meet. So the one below is a general. When you start to address the name of the traditional custodians or owners, you're making it a lot more localized and that is the preferred approach. If there are disputes about the land due to undetermined native title claims or multiple traditional custodians or owners having connection to the country, et cetera, it is appropriate to name both or all traditional custodian owner groups. So by using the word welcome in an acknowledgement of country, it could create unnecessary discomfort in the audience because that word is generally used at the beginning of a welcome to country. So for example, instead of saying, welcome to our school event, you could say, Thank you for being here today to help us celebrate all of the awards for our students. Da 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 da. <laughs> so when you put the word welcome at the beginning of your sentences, it can create a bit of discomfort for any traditional owners or other First Nations individual in the audience because when they hear the word welcome, it may remind them of a welcome to country. Remember that traditional custodians or owners are still here and still have connection to country. So your words should reflect present tense. They should reflect now. So present tense vocabulary could include continue, ongoing, maintain, now and in future, always was, always will be. There are many options there. Uh, for present tense vocabulary and these words to the right demonstrate that the traditional custodians and owners that you're talking about are still here and their um, spiritual connections still remain. Avoid words like was or were. Ensure that your words distinguish and recognize that Aboriginal people are different to Torres Strait Island people. So they are not one collective and homogenous group. Too often we hear people saying Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island people with no separation. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island people put us in one grouping and one homogenous collective. The more appropriate way of saying the sentence would be Aboriginal people and or Torres Strait Islander people. So now you're distinguishing that Aboriginal people are one group and Torres Strait Island people are another group. And the reason why we put and slash or there is because some people identify as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island people or some First Nations individuals identify as only Aboriginal or only Torres Strait Islander people. So again, I'll repeat the most appropriate sentence and the way to construct that sentence is Aboriginal people and or Torres Strait Islander people. There may be some discomfort from the First Nations community with the term emerging elders. In some instances, it may be hard to actually define who an emerging elder is. So instead of saying, I pay my respect to elders past, present and emerging, my recommendation to you is to use the word future instead. Future may be more appropriate vocabulary. And if you were to use the word future, it would then be said like this. I pay my respect to elders past, present and future.
use culturally appropriate terminology, for example, Gugiyalanji or First Nations. Try to be as specific as you can be if you know the traditional custodians or traditional owner group. The following may be considered inappropriate, Aboriginal, Torres Strait Islander and Indigenous. And the reason why they may be inappropriate is because they're too broad or too general. And many, again, I'm going to speak generally, traditional custodians and traditional owner groups prefer to be acknowledged by their language group or by their nation. So, for example, I would be preferred to be called a Gugielangi woman rather than an Aboriginal woman or an Indigenous woman. So, avoid terminologies that are offensive, such as Aborigines, it's a very outdated terminology. Acronyms such as ATSI, which is short for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander. ATSI, again, it's grouping the two cultures as one homogenous group when they're put together like that. But also it, it comes across or gives the perception that um, it's not worth the effort of spelling it out completely. And half caste. Um, I haven't personally heard this word in an acknowledgement of country, um, but it is a terminology to be aware of that we don't actually talk about bloodlines in this way. Where possible and appropriate, use traditional language names before English names. For example, here in Jule, also known as Daintree, where we gather today. Daintree is the English reference, and too often that is the norm when we're talking about places. So by using the traditional language names before the English reference, uh, what you're doing is you're demonstrating that you are challenging the unconscious bias and positioning the traditional custodians or owners and their country at the front and center. Now, I do encourage you to find out whether it is appropriate for you to use these traditional language names and also to correctly pronounce these language names. Capitalize words to demonstrate respect. Now, I know that not everyone will look at your script or your notes of your acknowledgement of country. However, this is a good practice to uh, get into the habit of to align with your intentions to demonstrate respect. So the following words can be capitalized or should be capitalized. Traditional owners, custodians, elders, Aboriginal, Torres Strait Islander, First Nation, Indigenous, country. And a lot of these words are nouns, so names of people or names of places. Um, and so for that reason, it is appropriate to capitalize them. Again, these are my preferences and personal suggestions or guidelines for you to consider before getting started. They aren't protocols that are set in stone um, or rules that you have to abide by. Um, but in my experience, these are ways that you can demonstrate respect so that you're conducting an acknowledgement of country to a high standard. Aboriginal individuals and or Torres Strait Islander individuals or First Nations individuals who are conducting an acknowledgement of country may also wish to acknowledge their own people or peoples, depending if they've got more than one connection, and other First Nations people present at the event to where they are do conducting an acknowledgement of country. Anyone may also choose to do this. So it would look like uh, this, for example. I acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land from which I am recording this short course, the Yiraganji people. I pay my respects to their elders, past, present and future. I also acknowledge and pay my respects to my Gugielangi elders, past, present and future. And I also extend that acknowledgement and respect to any other First Nations individuals and people who are online for this short course as well. 
and acknowledgement of country is your own way of paying respect to the traditional custodians or owners of the lands upon where you are conducting the acknowledgement of country. As long as the intention is to acknowledge, recognize and show respect. So think about how you would show respect to the traditional custodians of owners. How would you say that? It should be given in a way which is comfortable for you. So if you like to share in a way that is short and sweet, then take that approach. If you feel like you would share at a bit more length, maybe add in some storytelling, then share in that way. I encourage you to invest time and energy into making your acknowledgement of country contextualized and meaningful.